What if I told you there was once a grain that fed more people than wheat, outlasted droughts that erased kingdoms, and supported the oldest cities humanity ever built? A grain so small it is easy to overlook, but so important it shaped history. A grain so resilient that entire empires, Akkadian, Assyrian, Egyptian, Nubian, and Babylonian, rose on its strength. A grain that shaped the first writing systems, the first trade networks, the first granaries, and the first visions of abundance. And yet, one day, it disappeared. Not slowly, not over centuries, almost overnight. Its fields went silent, its terraces crumbled, its name faded from memory, and the world turned to weaker crops, forgetting the seed that once carried civilization on its back. This is the story of the forgotten grain that built empires, and the strange, sudden moment when humanity let it vanish. The archive opens in northern Sudan, in the ancient kingdom of Nubia. Archaeologists, excavating a storage pit that was 3,500 years old, found a layer of charred black seeds. They were tiny, smaller than millet, smaller than wheat. When they tested them, researchers realized they had found something extraordinary. Charred grains of ancient teff, a cereal older than Rome, older than Greece, older than the pyramids. A grain that supported the very first agricultural societies of East Africa and the Fertile Crescent, long before wheat and barley dominated their landscapes. But the story does not begin in Nubia. It begins even earlier. Around 8000 BCE, in the highlands of modern Ethiopia and Eritrea, early humans faced a changing world. Glaciers withdrew. Rains became unpredictable large game moved away. The people needed a plant that could survive the new, harsh climate. They found one. Tef, taf in ancient Giz, means lost. Because the grain was so tiny, it slipped through fingers like dust. It was an unlikely hero, but its power was hidden in its resilience. Tef could grow in shallow soil. Tef could grow with little water. Tef could grow in heat that killed barley and in cold that killed sorghum. Tef could grow when locusts devoured everything else. Tef could grow on slopes, terraces, riverbanks, anywhere. And when harvest came, it offered something rare, a complete protein, rich iron, essential amino acids, slow-burning carbohydrates, and a resilience that turned famine into survival. Before long, societies began shaping their lives around this grain. By 4000 BCE, Tef was the backbone of the ancient Horn of Africa. By 2000 BCE, caravans carried it north into Nubia and Egypt. By 1500 BCE, soldiers marching with the armies of the Kingdom of Kush were fed on Tef flatbreads baked on clay shards. By 1000 BCE, the grain appeared in the royal storage ledgers of Moreau, listed not as food, but as wealth. And then something remarkable happened the grain spread beyond Africa. Clay tablets from the Late Bronze Age show a cereal nearly identical to Tef being cultivated in Canaan, Phoenicia, and even parts of ancient Anatolia. Ancient texts describe a small seed that strengthens the body for long travel. Merchants prized it because it kept for years without spoiling. Armies prized it because it fed thousands from small harvests. Healers prized it because it restored iron and vitality faster than any known grain. And rulers? They prized it because Tef was reliable, even when wheat and barley failed. Empires rose on the promise of Tef. Empires relied on that grain. The Kingdom of Kush built its granaries around it. The Aksumite Empire fed its trade networks with it. The caravans of Punt carried bags of Tef across the Red Sea to the incense routes. Even early Egyptian farmers planted it along the Nile's southern banks, where irrigation thinned and soil grew weak. For thousands of years, the grain stood at the backbone of civilization. Until it didn't. Because something began happening around the year 1100 CE. A shift. A pattern. A disappearance. In the archaeological record, 
Teth appears consistently for 6,000 years. And then suddenly, from the ancient Levant, from Nubia, from the Nile Delta, it vanishes. Almost overnight. Only one region kept it alive. Ethiopia. Everywhere else, a silence. What happened? To understand it, we need to go to the moment when the world changed, not naturally, but by design. In the 12th and 13th centuries, expanding kingdoms and emerging trade powers began restructuring agriculture. Wheat was easier to tax. Barley was easier to measure. Sorghum scaled better with new irrigation canals. Rice, imported from the east, promised greater yields per acre. And empires wanted crops that could be counted, stored, standardized. Tef refused to cooperate. Its grains were too tiny for early mechanical mills. Its fields produced abundantly, but not uniformly. It resisted monoculture. It resisted control. And in societies shifting from local resilience to centralized power, that resistance was a problem. So governments pivoted. Taxes favored wheat. Wages favored barley. Irrigation favored rice. Land was restructured to prioritize large, measurable crops. Tef, adaptable but small, was pushed to the margins, not because it was weak, but because it was inconvenient to empire. And so, across North Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, it disappeared. But disappearance alone is never the end of the story. Something else accelerated the fall. As global trade flourished in the medieval period, powerful merchant guilds embraced crops with high market value, grains that could be shipped in vast quantities across oceans. Wheat traveled well, rice traveled well, barley traveled well. Teff did not. It was too lightweight, too moisture sensitive, too easily lost. Caravans could carry it. Empires could not. The grain that built early empires could not compete in the era of global commerce. And so it vanished, nearly everywhere. Except one place. In the highlands of Ethiopia, where terrace farming resisted colonial restructuring, Tef survived untouched. It remained the grain of farmers, healers, priests, mothers, and elders. Here, the ancient knowledge remained intact. Tef wasn't just food. It was identity. It was ceremony. It was medicine. Ethiopian healers used Tef porridge to restore strength after illness. Tef water soothed digestive problems. Tef bread, injera, delivered B vitamins and iron in a form more bioavailable than modern supplements. And then something remarkable happened in the modern era. After centuries of silence, the world rediscovered Tef, not through archaeology, but through illness. As anemia rose, as gluten intolerance rose, as inflammatory diseases rose, as soil collapsed and monocultures began to unravel, scientists turned to traditional crops for answers. There, waiting patiently in the highlands where it had always been, they found Tef again. In 2010, nutritional studies confirmed Tef has more calcium than any grain on earth. Tef has more iron than wheat, barley, or rice. Tef offers a full amino acid profile, rare for cereals. Tef contains resistant starch that stabilizes blood sugar. Tef thrives with minimal irrigation. Tef grows in degraded soils and restores them. Tef is naturally gluten-free and anti-inflammatory. Everything ancient farmers knew, science relearned. But the story does not end with rediscovery. It ends with a warning. Because just as the world began paying attention to Tef, something unsettling happened again. Corporations tried to patent it. Biotech companies tried to control its genetics. Export bans emerged in Ethiopia to prevent exploitation. And researchers worried that a grain meant to support small farmers might become another commodity stripped from its homeland. Tef was not erased by weakness. It was erased by systems that favored uniformity over resilience, profit over nourishment, control over abundance. And now, as the climate shifts and global crops struggle under heat and drought, Tef is rising again, 
not as a relic, but as a guide, a reminder, a warning, a seed of resilience. Because today, wheat is failing in heat it once tolerated, corn is collapsing in drought zones, rice is threatened by saltwater intrusion and soil exhaustion. But teff, teff thrives. It grows in 110 degrees Fahrenheit heat. It grows in shallow, rocky soil. It grows with minimal water. It grows in regions where other cereals collapse. It grows while restoring the land beneath it. It does not require chemical fertilizers. It does not require industrial irrigation. It does not require control. It is, in every sense, a survival grain. Not because it was designed for empire, but because it was designed for Earth. Maybe that is why it outlasted every ancient civilization that depended on it. Maybe that is why it resisted erasure even after the world abandoned it. Maybe that is why elders say the grain remembers how to live when the world forgets. The grain that built empires did not vanish. We turned away from it. Now we face the same crossroads as those ancient farmers. The same droughts. The same soil losses. The same rising heat. And perhaps the same choice. To continue with crops that require control and collapse under stress, or return to the grain that supported humanity long before empire, long before borders, long before the world forgot what resilience looked like. The grain that built empires did not die. It waited. Now, as the world shakes, it rises again. If this vault opened something for you, subscribe to Green Vault and hit the bell. Every like and every share helps preserve this wisdom. The next vault opens soon.